Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest. We've got Ruth Hiller. Ruth, appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. I'm so honored to be here. I appreciate being asked. Absolutely. So just a little bit on how we know each other. Um, Ruth is, is um, came into the same multifamily mentorship group as, as myself, uh, the Brad Sumrock group, and we were attending a Christmas party and and she was so kind to be hanging out with me and and then we, were, we all had our food and she said you want me to save you a spot and I was talking to somebody else and I said yeah that'd be great and then I couldn't find her so she ended up having a great meal and I was wandering around with my plate in my hand but hey it's, since then I've seen her do some fantastic things in the multifamily world so I wanted to make sure uh, we invited her on and to share. So, uh, Ruth, appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks again. I'm so glad to be here. Absolutely. So, first question: uh, How many properties and how many units are you invested in? I'm in 16 deals and over 2,800 units across seven states. Wow! And I, you've only been in the group for how long? Three years. Three years. Oh my gosh. I, yeah, it's a, it's a pedal you've to the metal. You've been busy. Yeah, I've been busy for sure. You've been, you've been busy. So yeah. share with the listeners, like what what did you do before you before the three years? What what did you do before then? What's, what's your background? Well, I, I call myself the accidental businesswoman because uh, I've always bought and sold real estate. And at age 29, I bought a, my first residential property in New York City that included a retail story, store. And then I have bought single family homes along the way. And then I, I, I owned a um, family owned multifamily business. And then aside from that real estate experience, I've been an artist and a graphic designer. So. Um, that that's that's why I call myself the accidental businesswoman because how can an artist well, like kill it in multifamily? <laughs> yeah, I mean like they they really don't seem to go hand in hand. I mean, being that artist, creative type, graphic designer, like I don't hear too many people that come from that background. But you you know what that I discovered? I was giving a presentation last week, and so I said. Uh, and I used to think it was a really big leap, but the thing that I noticed that both both art and graphic design and business it both requires problem solving. Yes, problem so solving that, is 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 huge, and I didn't really know that until I got into my first syndication deal. My partner was Raj Gupta. I don't know if you know him um, out of yes. Chicago, and he told me, Darren. You know, real, real estate, these large real estate transactions are all about problem solving. And, and it, I was surprised, but I've seen it play out and, and talking to a lot of different people. I've definitely heard um, a lot of different issues. So let's talk about that. What kind of problems are you seeing in, the, in, in your deals, 16 deals? And how did you and your team kind of go about solving um, well, I'm a GP in three deals, okay, and then I'm an LP in the uh, four, uh, actually I'm a GP in four deals and an LP in um, whatever the math is twelve. 12. Yep. <laughs> and so, so, so some of the ones that I'm the LP in, some of them like they have great management. Um, they have the it's it's meeting the pro forma and the budget, which is you know, and then some aren't. And so the thing that I've noticed lately, especially I'm sure I was listening to your last interview with Kathy Fetke about, yeah. um, you know, the, it, the rising interest rates and then the rising cap rates. And like, I think multifamily was a home run up until about last December. Like you could you could not manage it well and still make a ton of money. Right. So right. the problems I'm seeing now maybe are a little bit with some br the bridge loans and the, the strike rates and all that. That's a. Uh, across the board, especially if, you know, so there's been a lot of talk in our mentoring program and the coaching program, like how do you, if you underwrote for something and it's changing, how do you solve for the problem of what is that gonna look like next year? 
You know, right. what are the cap rates going to look like? What are the interest rates going to look like? What's your mortgage going to look like? You know, so. So what what are people saying they're going to do proactively to to you know manage that? Well, on on one on the, on one of the deals that I'm GP and we've uh, you know. Because we bought the the rate cap, and so the the insurance kicks in at a certain point, and then we have to, you know, take it out over the next two years and figure out with the increasing rate. You know, we have like uh, I think the rate goes up to five, and five point seven five, and then the bank kicks in right on in year two. So then you have to plot it out, looking uh, solve it for the future, right? So that sure. you make sure that you have enough. Uh, that you have enough to pay your mortgage. I mean, the property itself is performing performing phenomenally, but yeah, the, it's just been a little crazy ride with the interest rates. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, pro formas, they, they're the best guess based on the best information you have at the time, right? But then what I've noticed, because I'm also an LP in a lot of deals and a GP in a lot of deals, and what I've noticed is that not all deals move in a straight line up, right? Sometimes you have some, you know, some things that don't pan out exactly the way you want and then, but maybe there's some other factor that helps helps out. So um, on one deal that, that I was involved with, we ended up having a lot more people leave the property once we took over ownership. Right. So and people warned me that that was going to happen. You're going to have a drop in <laughs> in occupancy right when you take over. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to be fine. And sure enough, it happened. And I was like a little panicked at first. And then I went to the property management company and said, hey, here's the situation. Like we have all these, you know, unrented units. What are we going to do? And they just brought maintenance people from other properties and they turn those and rehab those much quicker than we had in our plan. So um, it was scary for a little bit, but then all of a sudden we were getting the higher rents for a longer part of the year uh, once once we got, you know put, put new tenants in there. So um, you could have good and bad happen, you know, right? Um, so interest exactly. rates is one factor. Um, but the other side of the factor is rental rates just keep going up i mean it seems like you know it's it's but do you think i mean do you think that's going to continue i don't know i don't know um you know i mean i you know i i, I was telling you I, I, my family has owned a, a multi-family since 1968 um which we just recently sold but the, the value of the building, and it was it was in Los Angeles, so it's a little bit different market. But the the, rent, the rents never went down since since we owned it. Maybe they didn't climb as much as we wanted, but I you know, and the value never decreased. So you know, historically, but I know we're in different times, so who knows, right? Sure, sure. <laughs> you know, the, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, right? So inflation. Are we going to have inflation? Well, if there's a lot of wage inflation, then People should be getting paid more, and if people are paid more, then they should be able to afford higher rents. You know, there's the flip side is pe some people are calling for deflation to happen, like the Fed's going to raise rates too much, and all of a sudden they're going to have to turn around and start dropping rates, and then all asset prices are going to be negatively impacted. Um, I don't know. I wish I had that crystal ball. I right? know, right? Um, and that, that's the thing too. We we stay in touch with the brokers throughout our deal, even after we've closed the deal. We talk to the brokers about like what the market's looking like. What are the cap rates looking like? Did you know? Did we underwrite the exit cap rate correctly? You know, and so that's we're always in touch with those people to make sure we have our you know the uh, the pulse of the market. Absolutely. So you, you're in sixteen deals. I've talked to some people that are they're like, look, inverted yield curve, I'm out. I'm 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 on the sidelines, I'm waiting for the correction and I'm not buying anymore. I have other people that are like, I'm full <coughs> speed ahead, and then people have kind of fall in between where they're continuing to buy but not necessarily going all in. And that's kind of my where I where I sit, I, I I'm like, you know, things can run a lot longer than normal. Like it could be another six months, it could be another two years or three years. You know, I don't want to not continue to to buy, uh, but we are at a little bit of a risky, you know, point in the in the uh, both the real estate market and 
obviously the stock markets have already started to correct, but um, what they do next, who knows? So what's your take on that? Where, where do you sit? That's funny because I was just thinking about that the other day. And uh, I'm thinking, I, I'm still all in, but I'm unless there's an amazing deal before the end of the year, I probably won't. Inve I'm still all in, right? I probably won't invest in a new deal or GP a new deal this year. Like I said, unless something has a huge price reduction and it's like, too, you know, irresistible offer. Um, you know, I've been in the market for a joint venture, which would mean like me and like four other people would buy our own building. So uh, some of us were underwriting a deal recently and the, the, I guess the broker in the market was pretty green and he just, he didn't, he didn't know what he was doing. And so we've underwritten it like six times and then he, he says, oh, the price is this. And so we were, and then like, no, we can't do it at that price. So I, I would do, I would definitely go for a joint venture if I, I found another one this year. And, and I'm looking at maybe instead of, you know, uh, me GPing is maybe investing in, in a known entity, you know, like one of the big, you know, the big guys that buy the $300, $500, uh, $500 million properties. Like maybe I'd park some of my money there because I still sure. need to place some money and I still need some depreciation this year. So I have to make, take a little bit of action on that. There's good problems to have, right? I know. So, hey, you're, all, you're a member of the multifamily mentorship group. You're also yes. part of the Tony Robbins Platinum Group. Um, yes. Why do you invest in? And you, before we hit record, you said you were involved in, you know, mentorship groups as well. Why? I mean, uh, mastermind groups. Why do you invest in these types of programs? Um, I, I'm gonna say sorry about the long. Um, I, I'm gonna no. say that I, five years ago I went to a Tony Robbins event. Didn't know who he was. I thought he was some weird business guru. And in the first 15 minutes of that event, it transformed my life and my identity. And I'm, I'm not kidding, I can't, I, I get chills still thinking about it. And it, it changed the whole trajectory of my life. And so- Tell me about that, why? What, what happened, what changed? Um, Tony was talking, so I didn't know who he was. I, I wasn't doing great that year, so I wanted to make some changes in my life. And so I, I asked a friend, it's a funny story. I said, what do I do? I'm just, I'm not doing well. I just don't know what I want to do. And she's like, have you heard of Tony Robbins? And I'm like, isn't he that weird business guru? No, no, you need to go to this event called Date with Destiny. So I sign up for Date with Destiny. I go to the event, it's 5,000 people. I'm standing in the crowd, like scared. What did I get myself into? Tony comes out and he's like, you're gonna dance. And I'm like, I don't dance. He's like, you're gonna jump. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't jump. And he's like, you'll be here till three in the morning. And I'm like, I go to bed at nine, right? And so at three in the morning, I'm like dancing and jumping. But he said something in the first 15 minutes, I felt like he was speaking to me about like biochemistry. And so I didn't grow up in a positive environment, right? So I didn't, I, I didn't, consider myself a positive mindset person. And my mindset shifted in the first 15 minutes of that seminar, I just became a different person. And so anyone that's met me post Tony Robbins would never think that I made it might have been a more negative person. <laughs> so I did so, meet you to post post Tony Robbins. So I did not see that person before. Exactly. So I just I, and I love Tony. So I continued. So he had his platinum partners thing. And I was like, Oh my God, it's so expensive, but let me do it. And then everyone was saying, Oh, uh, the finance trip that Tony puts on will pay for your whole platinum year. And so I went to the finance trip and I was like, yeah, no, I don't know how that works. Right. And then actually it did. So I, it, when I was sitting in the, in the finance trip, t uh, Tony brought up these two brothers that were um, teaching about multifamily syndication. And I had never heard of it before. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. I need to sell this property in California and start doing syndications, right? But then I just kind of let it go and didn't really know anything about it. And then fast forward three months, I met Brad Sumrock on a bus in Malaysia. And I'm like, so what do you do? And he's like, I teach people how to invest in multifamily. And, and I'm like, oh my God, can you help me? And so the rest is history. Was that on a, <laughs> was that on a Tony Robbins trip? Um. It was a it was a trip after the Tony Robbins trip. We had done a Tony Robbins trip through Cambodia, and then there were like fifteen of us ended up on a side trip in Malaysia. And Brad and Jen were uh, two of the people, and I sat next to them on the bus, and we became friends. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, that's crazy. I mean, so crazy. you think about 
look, the people talk about proximity, right? I mean, that is what yeah. it's all about right there. I mean, you, you went to Tony Robbins in the first 15 minutes, you said you changed your mindset. And then next thing you know, you're on a bus sitting next to Brad and, and it was exactly what you were looking for. And now you're, how many, how many deals? 16 deals, 20 16 deals. later, I know. you know, it's like, holy cow, that's a big change. So yeah, I, I still, I, I still, still pinch myself, right? It's like, oh my God, I can't believe it. And the whole reason I got involved in Brad's group is because I had a multifamily property that I owned with family members. And let's just say we weren't in alignment. And so the whole, I, I ended up at a, a, a rat race event. I think that I had met you that year. And, uh, I took 500 pages of notes because I, I wanted to improve Five, the property. 500 I, pages of notes. Because <laughs> I wanted to improve the property that I owned with my family. So that right. set me on this four-year journey. And like I said, it took four years to sell that. And uh, we ended up selling it for uh, almost triple what I thought it was worth. <laughs> oh, wow. Fantastic. Good for you. So, yeah. hey, talk to the listeners about... I mean, you, you've obviously, I don't know how you were before, but you've obviously learned how to take action. So, you know, there's some people that are listening that they want to get into real estate. They want to, you know, start buying some real estate and investing, but they're scared. So how do you coach people to kind of take action, even though they are scared? Well, I always tell people to find a mentor or a program and study it at least for six months and, and learn as much as you can and then you know be willing to take some action like what is the minimum amount that you could you know that you could invest and like when do you want to invest that by because like I always tell people like you know there's that saying buy buy real estate and wait don't wait to buy real estate and so I, I'm really lucky I'm an action taker and I, I've, I see people that aren't um, I have a good friend that isn't actually, and she, she keeps saying, yeah, next, your next deal, your next deal. And then the next deal comes and she's like, nah. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I, know, I know another guy that he's, I mean, he's, he's very, he's, he's done very well in multifamily. And um, he tells me, he's like, Darren, man, there's some people that I talked to 10 years ago that were like, you know, we're at the top, you know, and he just kept buying and, they still haven't bought, right? And so, some people may never get over that fence. Um, but then, but then, legitimately, there's other people that, you know, they're just finding out about the syndication world, you know, and they're just trying to understand it. And um, I know for me, I don't know about for you, but for me, and I had the capital. But wiring that first, the first LP deal I did was seventy five grand, and I was like, you know. Did I just wire this money to Never Never Land? Like I, you know, you're scared. But then all of a sudden, the next deal is easier, and the next deal is even easier. And then you see the returns, and you're like, "Holy cow! I wish I had done this sooner." Right, right. I remember my first deal too. I did it at uh, I was at Brad's event, and um, it was actually Brad's deal. And so, oh, yeah, it I, was. So I, you I, felt kind of safe, right? You're, so I felt safe. It's like you, the first rule is no like and trust the sponsor team. And I'm like, well, I know like and trust him. I've known him for about eight months, and you know, <laughs> I've been studying with him. So, uh, yeah, I get. I, I did the the deal that day, and I was like, it just even though you're investing in yourself, to me, it, it just felt like I was spending a lot of money. I was like, oh my god, I just spent all this, and then, you know, I had to correct my language and say I'm investing in myself and my future, right? So. Right. Right. That's, exactly. that, the mindset shift, right? So, and I think the people that don't, don't take action, they're scared they're going to spend it or lose it. But like you're investing. In, I, I in think your more lose it than spend it. And I think that people are just so afraid of losing anything, you know, of that yeah. they, they don't look to the upside that they could have, you know, um, I think that holds people back. Um, I, I, I think love it holds, that. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was going to say, I love uh, that terminology, accidental businesswoman, um, <laughs> you know, but at the age of 29, you were already buying real estate. So you, like you said, you're an action taker. I, I am an action taker. And I, the thing I learned about myself through this five year journey with Tony is that, um, uh, can I swear on your show? <laughs> sure. 
<laughs> I, I'm a, Go for I'm, it. A per, I'm a persistent motherfucker. Like I just don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> there, you, there you go. So yeah, so I just, I, I just keep going. If it doesn't work, I go again. If it doesn't work, I try something else, right? And I, I didn't really know that about myself, but um, I've always been that way, even before Tony. But it became more apparent to me uh, when I started to, like really getting into like figuring out who I am and like designing who I want to be, right? Well, I think that you know whatever you call it. You know, I, I call it thick skin. Um, I tell my kids you gotta have thick skin. Um, you know, the business isn't easy, right? I mean, it's not it's not easy, um, but there's huge rewards. And so you do have to be able to take no's. You do have to take be able to take rejection. You know, and, you're, and you've got rejection from, you know, Look, how many deals do you have to go after to win a deal, right? I mean, it's you you have a lot of people competing for every deal. And then once you get a, de- a good deal, you're you're all excited and then you got to pitch it to all the investors and then some investors are like, "I'm on board," and some like your friend is like, "No, oh, wait till the next one," right? And so that's rejection too, right? So you but you have to be persistent. Right, you have to keep going I'll, after it. I don't see that as rejection. I mean, the thing um, that I learned from Tony, it's funny because I used to, I used to hate sales. I'm not, I, I, I don't consider myself a salesperson, uh, but I actually am. And the, th- the thing that I learned about sales, I would come back from a Tony Robbins event, and I'd be like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" And everyone would be like, "What are you? What is it? I want it!" And so it's sort of the same thing. <laughs> It's the same thing with multifamily. Like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I just post how excited I am. And then it's it's been sort of a gradual build over the last year and a half, you know, educating people and getting people like getting people excited. There's a fine line. Like when you're raising capital for a deal, it's like people are really excited and you're going to raise the money. And then there's the fine line by, by like, yes, I'm offering you this opportunity. And like, oh my God, like let's get going now. Right. So it's kind of interesting when you're raising capital on a, on a deal. <laughs> Absolutely. And so talk about like where your focus is, because in multifamily, you could, you could build a company, right? Um, a syndication company. You can partner with other people. Um, if you partner with other people, you could, focus in on one area or another area you know what's where's your focus well my focus is investor relations and uh raising capital and then on this uh, the last deal i gp'd i helped with like all the new signage and the branding um and help with like some you know overseeing like interiors and colors and stuff like that because because i'm the artist right um <laughs> right <laughs> so i'm usually you know, in Colorado, I live in Colorado, so there have been a lot of great deals here. And there was one deal that I missed out on because I didn't have a team assembled, but now I have a team that would be interested in doing a deal in Colorado. So, um, you know, I've been more of a co-sponsor rather than a lead sponsor. And, you know, we'll see where the market goes. That's something I would be interested in, you know, sourcing a deal here and working with some other uh, people that I know from here that, that would be great asset managers. Because yeah, I'm not the asset manager. I, I, I understand not. it. <laughs> I sit so in you all don't the meetings. Do it? No, it's like a film. It's like a film producer. You have all the pieces, right? That you're super detail oriented, and and even though I understand it, it's like uh, I always say spreadsheets scared scared me to death, right? <laughs> till I till I started. I understand them and I can do them, but still, you know, being an asset manager, you got to just whip that stuff out. But that's the beauty is like you can, you know, know what your strengths are and focus on your strengths and then find other people to complement that. Right. Yes. So you don't have yes. to do it all. And in the beginning, I thought I had to do it all. And I got kind of deflated because I was like, oh, I got to find the deal. I got to underwrite the deal. I got to, you know, put together the team. And then I was just like, ah, and then, you know, <laughs> and so then. Yeah, I've been on a couple teams now. It's been, um, and that's what I love about it too. I love contributing to the team, and I love contributing to the communities that we invest in. So to me, it's like a win-win. So talk about that getting your first deal as a GP. You know, you can agree or disagree with me, um, but would love to get your take. I think in today's market, 
if you're going after large scale multifamily, you can't win a deal or it's very difficult to win a deal unless you partner with somebody that already has experience. You oh, totally. I mean? you, so you, you agree with that. So then you, you also get all the plus. So you, you know, look, you, I talked to some people outside, you know, group and they like, Oh, I don't know if I, you know, want to do that. I'm giving up a piece of the deal, but I'm like, you know, look, 0% of <laughs> whatever is still zero. You know, if you take a smaller piece of the deal and you partner with somebody that has experience, then you learn along the way too. Yeah, and it's interesting. The the last two deals I did, I did a deal in Tennessee and a deal in Texas with two different teams, and it's it's been a great learning experience to see how they they both approach asset management a little different, or the you know the budget meetings, and so that's been a great experience for me to see how everything works. And like you said, you know, it all sounds like oh, it's so easy. You just go buy a building, uh, right? And then and then you just run it. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I remember someone had asked me to come in on a team and be a capital raiser, and so I sat in the meeting, and they're like, you know, this is the deal. And so I said, well who's going to be the asset manager? And he said, oh, well, that doesn't matter. It's getting it's getting the deal that made. And I was like, what? I said, I'm out. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so talk about the, you said there were two different, um, you didn't use this word, but like two different styles, two different approaches um, for the two different teams. What did you see differently? And what did you learn by seeing the, the two different styles? Um, what did you learn? You know, I think I think one team is a little uh, loosey goosey is not the word. It's just not as regimented, and the other team is just there. It, everything's distributed ahead of time, and this and that, and everyone knows what's uh, what's going to happen. And then I feel like I've brought that back to the the, the first one, and we've gotten way more organized. Just because I didn't know, I've never run a deal before, so. You know, you have to get in there and see what's going on. I think it's good experience uh, to be on the different teams. A absolutely. I even you, you probably see it with all your LP deals. I, I mean, I know for me, I ended up investing with a lot of different syndicators and, you know, I knew I wanted to be a lead syndicator, um, but I wanted to see the styles of, of different ones and then take what I liked from some and, you know, and, and leave out some of the things I don't like from some and form my own style. And so um, there's that review kind of from the LP side, but then when you partner with different teams, you know, on the GP side, it's the same thing. You kind of see how people run the deal. And I mean, I've been on do, you know, the due diligence uh, process where, it's completely buttoned down and then another one where it's not right and exactly you could see that you could see the difference you know um so in any event uh talk about conferences like why do you go to conferences um i go to conferences because i have a growth mindset and so you know tony robbins talks about like the six human needs and one of my top human top human needs is for growth that's always been a driver for me. That's why I. That's why I'm persistent. Also, <laughs> so and I, I go to conferences and to learn. But I, also, I'm a people person. I love. I love being social. I love seeing what other people are doing. I love the thing I love about multifamily is the relationship building. You know, whether it, it's with the team, with the you know, or with the, my investors. Yeah, and. You know, it's funny because, I mean, people say that all the time, like, well, you're going for the networking, you're going for the relationship building, and it's a team sport, multifamily, and yeah, but what does all that mean, right? And like, so, you know, an example for me, I was I was at a multifamily conference in the Carolinas, and I was I was one of the speak asked to be one of the speakers, and I'm, I go to that, and I had no agenda other than, you know, go to to the conference, speak, you know, see people that I've seen before. Well, next thing you know, I walk away and I'm partnering on a, on a deal. Oh, wow. Like, be, but that would never have happened had I not gone there. You know, that, you know, those guys would not have, have, even though we knew each other, it's like being in front of people 
all of a sudden gets them to think, what are you, what are you looking for? What are you doing? What do you, you know, and how can we work together where, I don't know, people just don't all the time have you top of mind if you're not in front of them. Right. And that's why, that's why like you have to, like you do, you do your podcast, which is amazing, adding value, teaching people or in, you know, information newsletters, you know, just to keep, to keep you in mind. And this year it was funny. I sponsored an event in town just so I'd get a, you know, it was two sided. I wanted to get in front of people so they know who I am, but B, it's been really fun event to just get to know people too. So it's not. So talk about that. What, what did you do? Um, in our town, there's a program called the Month of Modern, and because I come from an art and background, uh, you, uh, art and design. So this background, is in Boulder. This is in Boulder, and there's you know, okay. Bo- Boulder's a, there's not a lot of multifamily in this community. You know what I mean? And but it's it's a higher end community, I would say. And, and so I just wanted to find a way because everyone knows me because I've been here 24 years and everyone knows me as an artist. And so I thought, oh, it would be fun to sponsor it. The name of my company is Yes MF. It's kind of cheeky you know and so I, I sponsored the event and i had to give a presentation called pecha kucha so it's like <laughs> what is 20 slot it's 20 slides 20 seconds per slide and the story had to be about inspiring and creating change so i'm like well you know i, I i've been on the path five years tony robbins inspired me you know, Brad Ru- Sumrock inspired me. And then, you know, and then it comes down to I had to create change in myself. So I had to get, I gave this presentation and it was, it was really funny actually. And so I've been meeting a lot more people in my community here because sometimes you want to get to know more people. Even though I've lived here 24 years, I feel like I probably haven't been so involved in the community. So it's a way to give back and like get to know people. That's cool. Uh, the other thing yeah. you said is that you're, you know, because you've been there for a long time, right? But you were known as an artist. Yes. So I think that that's a real thing for a lot of people is, okay, they want, maybe they want to get into real estate investing. They want to, you know, get into syndication. They want to, you know, bring more people to the fold, but they have this other career. They're kind of known for being a different person and different identity. How do you go about kind of making that change or at least, or adding on to it a new layer? Yeah, it was, it was interesting because in 2019, I've been painting for about 30 years and I had felt really burnt out. It didn't feel fulfilling to me. And I was, I was trying to think like why it didn't feel fulfilling to me. And it was just, it didn't meet all my needs anymore. And so I was like, well, you know, this is right like around the time I had started, you know, in, in, in personal mentoring. And so I don't know, just being willing to try something else, right? You know, I've, I've probably had six careers. I don't know, it's funny because Tony Robbins says, either you stick with your career your whole life or every seven or so years you change up for something new. And I'm like, I guess it was my time to change. <laughs> 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 but you know, just I think that I'm used to, I've been trained by Tony to uh, embrace uncertainty and embrace the unknown. And so just try it and see what happens, right? So. It's, I think a lot of people are scared because they're in their little box, you know, and it's it's not easy to step out of the comfort zone. And lately, I feel like I've been doing it a little too much. <laughs> I just I want to relax a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, if you're known as an artist and you come out and you say, hey, I'm doing multifamily syndication, that's kind of like a big change. And like, so you're having to build, you know, they always say, you know, no like and trust, right? So if you're capital raising, you're trying to, you know, you're, you're presenting opportunities for people to grow their wealth. Well, before you were selling paintings, right? And so why, you know, you have to make kind of a shift to build that trust with, with those people in a new way. Yeah, that, it was interesting, right? And then when I joined the, the mastermind, you know, I asked, I said, well, I think I want to raise capital. And, and Brad had told me, he's like, well, if you want to raise capital, you have to nurture your database. You can't just go out there and say, hey, now I'm doing multifamily. You know what I mean? So it, I, 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 I developed a brand. I developed a newsletter and I send a newsletter out. I think it's been a year and a half now. Every, every two weeks, some educational thing about multifamily. And then I have a really high open rate. I get like 60% open rate because my emails are short and they're funny. And so then people just started calling me up like, 
like, what is this you're doing? And then they, then I would post on all the, the deals I bought and what I'm learning. And then people just start, I th you, you have to be a little bit more in the public eye if you're going to shift your identity, I think. Because otherwise you can't just, you know, wake up one day as an artist and the next day like, here, I'm, I'm the multifamily maven, you know? <laughs> right. Well, I think so that... I, the I think that's important what you what you said is that you that nurturing right so you um, you have your network and then you're letting people know what you're doing um, way before there's really a need to have you know have them jump into an opportunity and I think there's a lot of people that have reached out to me and they're like oh well social media and all this stuff like I don't I don't think I want to tell people really what you know post anything until i get a deal or until like go full cycle or you know like there's always like this thing down the road kicking the can down the road but people want to learn right there's certain people in your network that are like i didn't know about this right and, and most people don't know about it right so they yeah. don't not only they've never heard of multifamily they don't know what what a syndication is right so um but the i would say that I did that newsletter for, I don't know, eight or nine months before I ever had a deal. I just said, oh, let me just educate people. And then when I have a deal, then, then I, you know, whatever. So that, that's sort of, that's how I did it. So, and I, I was always taught through Tony, like add more value, you know, instead of asking for something, you want to give something, which right. before Tony, I probably didn't do much of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were painting, you were, you were given from your, your creativity and, you know, artistic, um, you know, I was going to say artistic brains and, but yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's, that's a completely different world. And, um, it is, but it isn't, like I said, it's all about relationships in any, it's about relationships. And I think it's about how you feel about yourself. Right. So as an artist, it was hard. I couldn't sell my art very well, but I could sell a multifamily, which is so odd to me because it's both sales, right? But it's all about like a, a belief, uh, you know, a limiting beliefs or, you know, I think I had more limiting beliefs as an artist than I do as in multifamily. I feel like anything's possible. Why not? That's awesome. Anything is possible. I mean, look, you're, you're <laughs> in three years, you're in 16 deals. When you joined, you had no idea, right? Yeah. And, and... It, this is what I also tell people is, you know, when you join, you were, pro you were thinking about your property that was in, in California, your family property, and you were trying to figure out how to, you know, best manage that and sell it at the best price. And, um, and then the next step was like grow Ruth's net worth, right? And then all of a sudden it becomes bigger than that. And it's like, how can I educate other people and that's what I try to tell people is like look you think you're just doing it for yourself but two three four years down the road your network you know listeners your network is going to be coming to you and saying how'd you do it right exactly which is cool right okay. that, 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 it's to me, so giving, cool it's very cool it, I would say most of my investors are women and it's funny someone had suggested to me you should target women I was like oh, I don't want to target women but then I found like women targeted me and I mean in a good way right and I was like well and as I more I got into the business like commercial real estate is 90% men I'm like yeah. a female in a male dominated field of commercial real estate and so why why wouldn't why don't why wouldn't I want to educate women on that cuz I I think we, a, a, more women don't have confidence to invest than men. Why do you think that is? I think it's not taught. I, I don't think investing is taught. Like I said, but it's I didn't not. Really... It's not. It's not taught to men or women, though. Yeah, but I think right? I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know why. I think just the you know the traditional roles that we play. I mean, I think it's gotten better, and there's a lot more women. You know, but I'm I'm interested too in like. Because people aren't taught about investing, but they're not also not taught about financial literacy. I think now they're starting to do that in school. But like when I was growing up, like, again, like my dad taught me how to balance my checkbook and how to keep books and stuff like that. That was like the extent of my business training. <laughs> but I got, you know, and then they said, say, put, you know, save a little money. But that, that, that was about it. Right. And then there's so many good resources out there now like Robert Kiyosaki, there's like a ton of books that you could read that can help you. And that's what I, I, I like to donate and help 
organizations that help women with financial literacy and mindset? Because I think that, you know, because you could be financial literate, but like you're saying, like some people don't have the mindset to take action. Yeah. And, and look, there's also, so you're, you're educating women in your network. Um, look, there's a lot of books out there, right? There's a, there's a lot of books. There's a lot of, you know, podcasts. There's a lot of blogs. There's a lot of different resources, both free and paid. Um, but when you go to somebody that you know, like, and trust, and then they recommend a book or a podcast or a mentorship group, it means a lot more. So I read a lot of books and a lot of the books that I read are, you know, a guest on the show tells me about a book, about a book that I, you know, I trust that person and I, you know, admire what they've done and they're seeing value from it. So I decide to look into it. Um, or I'm at a networking session I'm with a bunch of real estate people and they're like, have you read this book on, you know, whatever Tom? I remember the first one was Tom Wheelwright's, um, <laughs> what, Wealth what, Ability? what's his, uh, yeah, it, yeah it was, I forget the name of the, his first book, but they're like, have you read it? I'm like, no. And I went and bought it like the next day and I was like, oh my gosh, that had so much value. And, yeah. but it was because somebody that I knew had recommended it. I probably wouldn't have just found it on Amazon. Well, that, that's the same thing. It's just like recommendations. Because I, I, some guy, I had a call with him and he said, oh, I've lost my shirt in multifamily. And I said, really? And he's like, I said, where are you meeting these people? He's like, on crowdfunding sites. And I was like, oh, uh, do you know these people? No. And so that's uh, no like and trust the team. And number two, have to have a kick-ass asset manager. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So I've had a lot of people on and I've asked people like, have have you lost money on a multifamily syndication? I've only had two people tell me that they've lost money on a syndication. One of them said it was due to fraud. Um, they, they, the, they, they actually didn't even have the property. They just took the, you know, raised the capital and, oh and my God. ran with the money. Um, and then the other person was a crowdfunding uh, platform. And, I'm, I'm sure there's good ones too, but like I, that's the one of the benefits I think of syndication over buying stocks is, you know, you can call the, the sponsor, you've got their cell number, their email, like you can actually call and talk about the deal um, yeah. before you invest and also after you invest where you can't do that. You don't get access to, you know, the C-level executives of Amazon, right? Um, so <laughs> that's true. And so no, I haven't lost any money in a syndication, but let me see, was it 24 years ago? I bought a 32 unit multifamily property in Denver, Colorado, and I lost my shirt on it because I didn't know how did to do due really? diligence. Oh, I didn't know what I was doing. Come on, this is way before I, I did any education. I didn't know how to do lease audits. I didn't know how to do due diligence. And so it just, it was a big disaster. So. I, so how did you lose your shirt, though? I'm curious. Um, well, so you just did real, you just overpay? No, I didn't. Yeah, well, I overpaid. I didn't know enough about the neighborhood. I did everything wrong. So I had never, you know, I just assumed you just buy an apartment building and you run it, right? <laughs> that was 23 years ago. So so I bought this building. The realtor sold it to me, and then I said, I, I don't know how to run it. And she's like, Well, we'll help you find someone. And then they couldn't help me find anyone. And she was way out of her league as far as she was not a commercial broker. She should have never sold me that property. And then, as you know, sometimes when you buy a multifamily, they populate it with tenants just to get the rent roll up. But like the right. tenants were like drug addicts. Oh, no. oh, <laughs> and so oh, no. I had to evict everyone. And then, then there was like, uh, then the boiler went. This is 23 years ago. It was like $50,000 repair. And I was like, so I just, I, I, I just... I just got rid of it because I, it was just a money pit and I didn't know how to run it. So that's right, why it's important right. to like have a mentor, find a group, do yeah. study with someone 
who's already done what you want to do, right? You don't need to reinvent the wheel. That's that's my biggest lesson. With That's why I go with all these groups because if you've already successful at it, I want to talk to you. How did you do it? I don't want to read a book and figure it out on my own. <laughs> that, so. That's huge. And that goes to, like I again, I meet some people that, I meet a lot of people that are in mentorship groups, um, but I also meet people that are looking to get into space and, and they don't see the value in it. And they're like, you know, I don't, I don't want to spend 30 grand, you know, and, and I'm like, I get it. But like, if you make one mistake on a $10 million or $20 million deal, like it can more than 30 grand, way <laughs> more than 30 grand. And, you know, not only you, but if you're raising capital, then it's costing all your investors and you lose your reputation you could be one and done. So, you know, knowing just the team members alone, like who are the good property management companies? Who are the good rehab people? Who are the good inspection people? Who who should you bring on for due diligence? Like all those team members that you end up, you know, bringing alongside you that will provide you with advice and counsel. You know, if you pick the wrong ones, it, it could be way more than a 30 grand mistake. Oh, totally. I, I, I fully believe in pay to play. And the first thing that taught me that was Tony was the Tony Robbins Platinum Partnership, which was quite expensive. But like I said, the information from the financial trip changed the trajectory of my life and has probably paid for that 10 times over already, just from what yeah. I've learned on the path I've been on. So it was worth every cent. I, I always say it is, but people, you know, people are going to do what they do. They Some people just want to do it on their own, you know? That's okay. Well, I, I also think you have to... Um, you have to have the right mindset and you have to be looking for how to get that value back, right? Because I think there are some people that... And I see people, you know, sign up for multifamily mentorship groups and they write the check and they just think the deal is going to come to them, right? Well, it's not, you know? So... <laughs> um, if that's your expectation, then don't write the check. So, you know, it's it's a matter of learning from other people and getting connected to the network. Um, but, you you know, you still have to do work. You still have to, you know, grind it out. Oh, totally. I was going to say, you do? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know what? You're such a sweet person. I had no idea that you had this persistence in you that you, that you oh, talk about. Oh, that's my yeah. middle name. Like you're always smiling, like you're always, you know, happy go lucky every time I see you. So you you think somebody like that is they don't have problems, right? Like they I, you just you just well, uh have a good presence about you. Oh, thank you. Well, I learned all that from Tony, so I I'm forever grateful to that man. Uh and, oh, and the the punchline of that story, this is remember I told you my friend sent me to his event and so yeah. I'll, if, if you remember, so I came back and I was so happy and I changed my life and I took her to dinner. I'm like, oh my God, I got to thank you. This is thank you. And she said, I'm so, you know, this is really weird, but I've never done any of his work and I'm not sure why I recommended it to you, but I'm glad I did. Oh my gosh, really? So that person didn't get any value out of it. Went to the, went to it, but just didn't. No, she'd never, yeah. she'd, she'd never oh, been she, to any of it. No. She's she never just, even gone. She, she had a download to recommend it to me because she'd heard about it and I trusted yeah. her and I went and she'd never ever done any of his work. Holy cow. I know. That's a pretty funny story. Look, I've been to some conferences where, you know, maybe the six, there's six or seven speakers and four of the speakers I listened to and I'm like, I didn't feel like I got any value out of that. And all of a sudden one says something, I'm like, oh my gosh, if I apply that to my world, to my business. That could be huge. I don't know that everybody is looking for that. You know, some people pay and they just want to be like slapped in the in the head in terms of like what you know. You have to be actually looking for the value. I think. Yes, I, I think so too. I mean, there's a lot of people that go, like you said, join groups or whatever, and then they don't take any action. Like I said, you have to be persistent. And, you know, all those goal setting workshops that we all just love to do. You got to do them. Right. If you have right. to have to click, if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there? <laughs> I, I, absolutely. So it's I, I don't want to put myself on the, this accountability, but I but I'm going to ask you. So I kind of 
feel that way about Tony Robbins. I have not gone to any of his events, but I kind of feel like I'm not the jump up and down, clap my hands, like, you know, till two or three in the morning type of guy. And then I have all these other people that are like, come back and they're like, oh my gosh, that was so awesome. That was, you know, so amazing. So I loved when you said that you weren't that that way and you were skeptical and then, oh, holy cow, in the first 15 minutes, like he converted you. Well, yeah, he converted me and he gave me tools to change my life in a way that I never had before and that you could actually implement. And so my goal when I went to that event was like, if I could have one tool to just, you know, shift stuff. I came out with like 10 toolboxes. <laughs> it's amazing. But you have to be persistent. You have to, you have to implement those tools. Otherwise it's like, again, joining a group and not taking action. It's the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. So I had a guy on the podcast, maybe, I don't know, a month ago, Hemel um, Badiani. And he was somebody I met down in, in the conference in North Carolina. And, um, he shared with me that he went to some, some across the world to climb this mountain with people he didn't even know. And when we stopped recording, I, I was asking him questions about it. And, and I told him, I said, look, I really want to do this motocross thing, like, like off road. I've never done, I've owned street bikes, but never off road. And he's like, just do it, man. And I grabbed that accountability. I'm like, you know, I'm nervous and scared, but in two weeks, I'm I'm going now. I'm signed up, and I don't know anybody that'll be there. We're going four days through uh, Yosemite. And, Ooh, that would be amazing. Yeah, it's like one of those things of like, you know, you said earlier that you, you find yourself having so many of these things that make you uncomfortable, right? And making yourself uncomfortable, it's like scary, but also exciting. You know, it is, it time. is. And so t know. Tony says all the magic happens outside your comfort zone. Yeah. So I, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I see, I love that you embrace so much of what you learn there. I mean, um, and that's the power of, of Tony. I got to give him credit. I mean, I've never been to any of his events. Um, um, well, maybe but we'll he, change that. <laughs> right. He's positively impacted many people's lives. And um, I hear it in you for sure. Yeah, I, I've, I have met amazing friends through that group for sure. So your network, how did you how did you build your network? So if you, you know, I'm asking. So passive investors are like, oh, I don't know who my network would be, and how do I start it, and how do I go about? It? You said for eight months you were nurturing them before you actually had a deal. You know, who were the people that you put on the list, and how'd you nurture them? I had about 500 people in my database from like Tony Robbins people I met, and from friends that I had and then I just, uh, like I said, I came up with a brand name and then I just started putting out uh, educational emails like, what is the syndication? You know, just, and then texting people, hey, you know, just, that I hadn't talked to. I think Jesse Itzler says that you should text at least three people a day and say like, thinking of you, how are you doing? No need to, you know, kind of thing. No need to respond, just to let people know that you're interested. I think that's the biggest thing I got from Tony was just being interested and that built what the more interested I am instead of me 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 you know and then the more bit the bigger my network is and that really, yeah yes. and, that, and that goes to mindset because like you know some people I think think like I'm gonna be bothering people if I send this email to my network right but you know if you had 500 people maybe there was 200 people that were not interested you know, but maybe there was two or 300 people that were like, what is this syndication thing? Let me, and it's the first time they've heard it. And, you know, or maybe it's 50 people, who cares? It's like, you're, you're doing it for the people that they don't know, and you're trying to educate them. And so if you're not doing it, and nobody else is doing it, then how do they even get educated? Right? So I said, that's what I'm trying to get into people, other people, start telling your network, you know, what you're doing. Even if you I tell, I tell deal. everybody, I tell everybody. And it's funny because 
they're like, so what do you do? And I said, oh, I teach people how to double their money in two years and not pay taxes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, maybe we're that, not doubling that, our... <laughs> and then that gets like, people well, <laughs> interested, right? <laughs> that gets people yeah. interested for sure. Or then I tell them my company name, you know, yes, MF, and then should you buy multifamily? Yes, motherfucker, you should. You know, so it's just kind of... <laughs> so, <laughs> people, you know, and then I judge if, if they say, oh, that's cute, then I don't go on. But, oh, my God, like, tell me about it, right? You can kind of judge if someone wants to know. But I, I'm excited about it. I love it. And so I just tell everybody I know. And if they don't want to talk about it, we can talk about something else. But you always have to... If it's your passion, you want to tell people about it. <laughs> right, right. Exactly, exactly. So that's fantastic. Hey, so where do you go from here? I mean, what's your next big stretch goal? Oh, my next big stretch goal. Hmm. It's to be a lead sponsor. Not this year. Okay. It'll be uh, next year. 20, 2023? 2023, yeah, this year, I don't know with the market and stuff, you know, unless something amazing came. I'm, I'm open to it. I'm not going to say never, but that's my big goal for next year. You know, this this year was to GP two, uh, three deals, which I did. And then it's, it's like two or three deals a year, you know, depending on the market and the team. And what I'd really like is there's a couple teams I've worked with. I'd like to continue to work with those on a, reg there, on a regular basis. Yeah, that's cool. Um... So lead sponsor in 2023, you heard it yeah, right we're... here. <laughs> well, we're going to see it happen, I'm sure. All right, we're going to see it taker. happen. I'm an action taker. Um, you are, you are an action I'm... taker. And that look, that that inspires other people. You know, um, that's, you know, you're getting other people involved both at the LP side, but then eventually they're going to say, hey, how do, you, how do you do what you do? And, um, and then you teach them that. So, hey, um, if people want to get to know you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Um, they can go on my website at yesmfnow.com. That's yesmultifamilynow.com, yesmf now. And then I have some free info and some educational articles on there. Like what? Oh, it's just like how a syndication works and why I like stocks versus real estate. There's about... 12 or 13 different articles and then I post my uh, newsletters on there too. So there's some information awesome. that you can get. Awesome. So listeners check that out. Yes, mfnow.com. And what do you like to do for fun outside of work besides painting cuz you you are an artist. I love to be in the mountains. I just uh I have a place up in Vale and I was there last weekend and there's this 10 mile drive up on this little teeny dirt road it takes like an hour because it's a really bad road and it's like the most beautiful place you've ever been. So just to be out in nature would be my favorite thing. I love Colorado. You, you live in a very special place. Um, but I have to say I was driving a big old RV and driving through Colorado windy mountain roads is it's stressful yeah and, and you have cars that are live there that are just whizzing by you and i'm like ah you know i just I gotta grit and bear it i can only go as fast as i can go you know um but hey i really appreciate you coming on the show um i think that there are so many people that think it's out of their realm you know think that they can't get involved and i love that you're um as persistent as you are and I love that you're you're building the network and um, you're always a pleasure to be around so I appreciate again you coming on the show um, listeners go ahead I say thanks Darren it's been such an honor I, I always love talking to you absolutely well thank you um, listeners until next week signing off and uh, we'll go from there take care bye Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com learn. 